sur l'avenir de Montréal, où il y avait 1000 personnes. Et cette conférence internationale est différente dans sa formation, dans son organisation, mais c'est dans le même esprit. On veut reprendre l'idée de collaborer ensemble. Et euh, au but de cette euh, conférence, je dirais, il y a un atelier demain, dimanche, à midi, où on va discuter ensemble une déclaration pour Montréal, a Montreal Declaration, qui va essayer de un peu faire une réflexion sur comment on peut partager certaines valeurs et certains principes ensemble. Alors, je vous invite de participer à cette colloque, euh, à cet atelier, et à la session plénière demain, on va discuter comment on peut l'adopter. Et finalement, je dois dire que, vous savez, c'est bien beau d'organiser des conférences de cette importance, mais il faut aussi penser à le suivi, l'avenir. Donc, on vous invite... Jeudi, le 25 avril, au 3720 Avenue du Parc, le grand euh, édifice de, euh, alternative, où à 7 h jusqu'à 9 h, on peut discuter ensemble comment est-ce qu'on va mettre tout ça ensemble et quelle doit être notre prospective sur le terrain pour l'avenir de notre société montréalaise. Alors, je vous invite en conclusion d'être là pour discuter librement Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire ensemble à partir de cette conférence? Merci pour votre attention. I'd like to thank uh, Dimitri, who uh, kept that to a very close four minutes. He, he is just as disciplined as the organizing committee. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Alana Dow, who has been uh, president of the Milton Park community uh, for, or was a president of the Milton Park community for nine years, uh, and who's going to speak a little bit about the history of Milton Park. Please give her a warm round of applause. We may have problems, but you don't have to see me. Um, okay. Communauté Milton Park is made up of 16 co-ops, five other non-profit housing entities, and another four groups, one of which is responsible for the commercial properties on our territory. On est situé de la rue Hutchison à l'ouest jusqu'à la rue Sainte-Famille à l'est et nord jusqu'à Avenue des Pins et sud à Milton. The history of the 20-year fight for Milton Park is a long and complex one, so this short presentation, which probably should be shorter, but will just hit the high points. For further information, you could consult the guide, we call it our guide, Communi Communauté Milton Park, how we did it and how it works. I believe there are copies for sale here in the bookstore. Um, it was written by the late Lucia Kowalak and Carol Pichet Burton. It has the history and the nuts and bolts of the organization. Also, there is the new book published um, by Black Rose Books, edited by Joshua Hawley and Dimitri Rizopoulos, that also has a lot of history in it. The people of the neighborhood were, I'll just get there, there's Cartier Milton Park, and here are the people who originally lived in the neighborhood. They were a socioeconomic and ethnic mix of families, seniors, and single people. They lived in small to large apartments or in single rooms. Their homes were located, for the most part, in beautiful turn-of-the-century buildings. The architectural details adorning most of our buildings in Milton Park are a source of pride in the community. The residents of the area learned in 1968 that a developer had been secretly buying up six city blocks where they lived 
with the intention of demolishing their homes for a three-phase high-rise complex. This was the trend of the 60s and 70s, to tear down existing low-rises and replace them with high-rise towers under the guise of urban renewal. The Milton Park Citizens Committee was formed that year, 1968, to decide what was to be done. Along with the social workers, community organizers, and urban planners of the university settlement based on St. Urban Street, the members of CMP began their work with fellow residents. This involved door-to-door -door visits, petitions, demonstrations, marches to City Hall, among other actions, and work with McGill architecture students to show how alternatives to high-rises could work in renewing an urban area. Sorry, missed one of my photos, there you go. By 1972, however, Concordia Estates Limited, the developer that had cleared 255 buildings, imagine, 255 buildings emptied of tenants and small businesses and were ready to proceed with demolition. Plusieurs membres de la CCMP ont occupé les logements vidés et les bureaux de développement. 59 personnes étaient arrêtées. Although they were acquitted, the demolition had succeeded, and phase one of the La Cité complex, as it is now called, was built. Three apartment towers, a business tower, and a hotel, now a McGill residence, loomed over the neighborhood. My neighbor saw her family home where she had been brought up, destroyed from across the street where she had been resettled. It was a terrible time. And here we have, on the left, we have the present and what was destroyed to put that tower up. Exhaustion and feelings of failure among the militants followed. However, the developers had run into trouble. A number of factors meant they had little access to more funding to continue phases two and three. Armed with this knowledge, the late Lucia Kowalik decided to continue the fight. She knocked on every door of the remaining buildings, urging residents to continue to fight for the right to create co-ops and save their homes. She also asked Heritage Montreal for a grant to research the feasibility of putting the land into the hands of residents who would form housing co-ops. Um, en 1977, la communauté a appris que Concordia devrait vendre les deux tiers de la territoire pas encore développé. Um, il n'avait pas les finances de compléter. Three important factors would help in the acquisition of this land. The Parti Québécois was elected, the community had many experienced militants, and the research provided by Heritage Montreal supported their claims. It was time to act. The founder of Heritage Montreal and creator of this Centre for Canadian Architecture, Phyllis Lambert, was critical in getting the Government of Canada involved and having the property be purchased by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. In 1979, it brought the remaining buildings and land for $5.5 million dollars with a promise to turn them over to residents. In 1980, a comprehensive action plan was produced and accepted by the CMHC. They, however, began talking about market rents again, which was unacceptable. The goal had always been to preserve the neighborhood as it was, the socioeconomic makeup of Milton Park, and it was obvious most residents would have had to move if their rents were increased dramatically the community mobilized again. And the timing was perfect. 
upcoming referendum on the separation of Quebec from Canada prompted the federal government to act quickly. CMHC was instructed to accept the principle that Milton Park rents would be based on currently paid rents with modest increases following renovations. <laughs> A principle which the residents had agreed upon from the beginning of which I'm especially proud was that buildings already subdivided into rooming houses would remain that way as they filled the need for single low-income res low residents. La Société d'amélioration de Milton Park était fondée et était propriétaire temporaire des bâtiments et les terrains en octobre 80. It was composed, the SAMP, SAMP, of residents, experts in law, architecture, urban planning, business, and community development. It would oversee the work and turn over the buildings to co-ops and other nonprofits. SAMP was aided by the Milton Park Technical Resource Group, known by its French acronym GRT. 20 committed social animators, educators, architects, administrators assisted us in creating co-ops and providing the technical expertise during renovations. The 35-year mortgages were guaranteed by CMHC and financing was very complex. Once groups were formed, and here you see a map of the groups, the colors indicate all of the different groups, the 25 uh, groups which make up CMP. We had to continue to meet to discuss how we would prevent speculation, what principles we should make um, mandatory for everyone. Fortunately on the SAMP board was lawyer Robert Cohen he enlisted the help of renowned notary Francois Frenet, and together they developed the type of land trust which created Communauté Milton Park. You can read the details of how this was done in an article written by Susan Alchel in this yellow book entitled Condominium for Social Purposes. Imaginez le numéro de, de réunion avec tous les gens pas tous les gens, mais les représentants de tous les gens des coop, c'était euh, euh, une collection de 1500 personnes à peu près, et les délégués de chaque groupe ont décidé sur les principes dans la déclaration. The way it works, I'm sorry, I'm almost done, is that the co-ops own their buildings and the land directly under them, but they do not own the lands that may be at the side or in front or behind. Those are owned collectively by the entire group of co-ops and nonprofit groups. I'm just skipping ahead because I'm way over. The destination clause found in the declaration stipulates that the CMP, the co-ops, and other nonprofits are bound by rules that require access to quality dwellings for low and moderate income people, conserve the urban fabric and the architectural and socioeconomic uniqueness of the neighborhood, and provide stringent mechanisms to prevent um, speculation. It was a great day in December of 1987 when all co-ops were in agreement and signed the declaration that had been developed by Robert Cohen and Francois Frenet. This huge document outlines the principles and the actual um, tools needed to make sure that everyone follows those uh, regulations. 20 years of struggle to create a project unique in North America, the largest in Canada, this type of land trust, and the only one which is governed by a declaration of co-ownership has been formed. This photo of residents enjoying the community annual Fête des Voisins, 
neighborhood party, demonstrates, I believe, that this neighborhood has the potential to rise again to protect its quality of life. Just one challenge we face, just one, is ensuring that the vacant Hotel Dieu Hospital on our northeast border is not lost to private developers who are rubbing their hands with glee at the prospect of condos on the edge of the mountain. The CMP, along with the CCMP, is part of a 25-group coalition which has detailed plans for social housing, green spaces, and other community services on that land. I'm <laughs> I am confident that Milton Park will remain a vibrant, active community in the center of the city, a community built on the principles of democratic functioning and control of the land by its residents. Continuons. Thank Big thank you to Alana. I'd like to bring up uh, Nathan Mc. Connell, uh, McDonnell, sorry, for, uh, for a very brief note. He's a community activist uh, in Milton Park and uh, vice president of the Milton Park Citizens Committee. Nathan. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Yes, thank you. So I'm just going to say a quick uh, point to a quick uh, statement to also give a sense of where this conference is heading and where it's, com also where it's coming from and where it's heading. Um, so, um, so in the, okay, how's that? <laughs> Great, thank you. So we are fighting a war. We're fighting a war. And you're all a part of it. You're all a part. In fact, everyone in Montreal is a part of it, even if they don't know. Because when I walk around Montreal especially downtown, St. Henry, Santa Cruz. There are condos going up everywhere. Everywhere. Massive condos. And the statistics say that 50% of condos in the high-rise towers that are being constructed, 50% are being bought by speculators. By speculators who are not even going to live there. It's out of control. We all know it. I don't have to give the statistics, but so some statistics are. Last year was the, the most intense year of construction in the history of M Montreal. Housing prices are going up, yet we still have massive, a massive housing crisis in Montreal and in, and, and, and in wider um, um, Quebec. Over, uh, over 230,000 people are paying more than 50%, uh, 230,000 households in Quebec are paying more than 50% of the income in, in, in housing, and 120,000 households are paying more than 80% of their rent in housing, which is too much, which is too much. So we're in a war, and gentrification is only the latest episode in a in a foul in a st struggle of thousands of n thousands of um, um, years over land it all comes back to the land colonialism the 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 um, the um, the um, uh, um, uh, and and the, uh, in, when, at the beginning of mm, capitalism, when c common land was turned into private land, um, mm, gentrification is just the latest episode. So we're, we're here to talk about land. And we're here to talk about community control of land for housing and for the wider economy. Um, and on that note, I draw to your attention, uh, the, as uh, um, Alana mentioned, we just published a mm, book about the community control of land. And I can't see it here, so, but she mentioned it before, so I'm not going to say it. Um, that's fine. Um, but but we, it, it's here, available at the store, and it gives the, the Milton Park story, but also other projects around North America. Um, the idea for this conference came out of the fact that last year was the 30th anniversary of the CMP and the 50th anniversary of the Milton Park Citizens Committee. So we have a long legacy behind us, but we want to go further. We want to go further. We we're not comfortable with what we have. So 
there's Hotel Jo and uh, 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 Lana talked about it, a massive site of huge potential, the second oldest hospital in North America, a project that we estimate is worth 123, it's going to cost $123 million to do. We can do it. We're pumped. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be complex. So we're going to need everybody's help for the mobilization to, to make it happen. But also, we're not the only ones. There are many other neighborhoods in Montreal that have similar big community campaigns for huge community controlled projects. There is, in uh, uh, Hunsik, we just had a presentation this morning about the, a, a huge site that's owned by the municipality that the municipality is working with community groups to see what can be done with it. There's the, um, in um, Saint Michel, there's a huge former. Um, Quarry in Saint Henry. There's the Maltin in Pont Saint Charles. There's a huge um, area, a huge area in the north of Pont Saint Charles. One minute. In um, in Cote de Neige, there's the Hippodrome. There's and, and and it goes on and on. There's these massive projects worth tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, and community groups. They have ideas. They have proposals, but it's, it's very hard when we're fighting against the power structure. Because it's nice to have ideas, but we're fighting against capitalism. And there's only one way we can win. Join forces. So today, I invite you to join us to build a pan-Montreal movement for the community control of land to take us beyond mm, capitalism. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Nathan. Alors, avant de passer au moment principal qui est la présentation par nos panélistes, j'aimerais souligner la présence de M. Bob Cohen ici dans la salle, qui a été aussi un des pionniers. Alana en a parlé. Peut-être qu'il y a d'autres personnes que je ne connais pas. Là. Je ne veux pas commettre d'impair en, en, en ignorant d'autres personnes aussi qui ont joué un rôle fondamental dans le logement social ici. Maintenant, je suis très heureuse de vous présenter notre première conférencière, Lorina Sarate de Mexico que j'ai connue au Forum social mondial qui s'est tenu à Montréal il y a quelques années. Alors, heureuse de ton retour à Montréal. Lorena est la présidente d'une coalition internationale dans le domaine du logement, HIC, Habitat International Coalition, dont euh, nous sommes membres également. Je, la Fédération d'habitation coopérative du Canada est membre, ainsi que la Fondation Abri International, Rooftops Canada Foundation. Alors ici, on est beaucoup des gens euh, du Nord. Euh, on a des gros problèmes de logement euh, ici, même dans notre hémisphère euh, riche. Euh, Lorena, elle, va nous parler de la situation du logement, mais également des luttes. Hein. C'est pour ça qu'on est ici. Euh, pas seulement se plaindre, mais voir ce qu'on peut faire, puis souligner nos victoires alors en Amérique latine. Merci Lorena. La parole est à toi pour, euh, on va dire, 18 minutes, c'est possible non, on va essayer. Je vais te faire des petits signes. C'est ça. Merci beaucoup. Allô? Merci. Allô? Ça marche? Oui? Ah, bonjour. Euh, merci. Merci beaucoup, Louis. Merci tout le monde. Merci, Dimitri et Nathan, pour l'invitation. Je m'excuse, je vais parler en, en anglais, euh, mais je serais heureux de parler avec vous euh, un en un euh, en français. <rire> Euh, mais je suis un petit, un petit bit de le faire euh, maintenant dans, dans le Vic Forum. Um, so, switching now. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you again. It's an honor and a great pleasure to be here in uh, this wonderful city, this wonderful uh, province, uh, full of uh, a long history of social activism that, is, that continues to, to inspire people and movements, social movements uh, all over the planet. So, uh, trying to share quickly some of the struggles and, and achievements and, and, and 
things and public policies even uh, they have been working in different places in this case in particular in Latin America but as you can see as members of international uh, coalitions or platforms uh, so this one uh, HIC, uh, as Luis mentioned, is a, is a global um, coalition of different kind of organizations, including several here in, in Canada. Actually, uh, one of our board members at the global level representing North America organizations is here, Stefan Corriveau. Uh, he's going to speak later on this panel. Um, so uh, housing co-ops, um, different kind of associations, but also people at the universities uh, working on, on these issues. Uh, and also individuals and activists in around 120 countries right now. Membership is open, so please consider applying to that. It's just uh, kind of a collective uh, action kind of platform. And the same with the Right to the City platform, although that is not an institution, uh, it's more like an action-oriented space for, for political action including several networks uh, that I'm going to mention very quickly, many of those with uh, presence here in, in Canada and in particular in, in Montreal and Quebec. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with, uh, with pictures or images from Latin America, but some, many other places in the world, uh, our cities are places of inequality, uh, huge and actually widening inequality. So we can see that reflected, of course, in the cities and in, in how the city is, is built. Um, these two pictures on the left are from Mexico City. Uh, the other ones on the right are from Buenos Aires. You can see very similar landscapes, actually. So several questions, of course, and, and things to think about it. But in particular, what's the role of the different actors? What's the role of the state? Uh, where the public money is going, and so on and so forth, right? And what kind of things are uh, you know, approved and see as a good things and investment for the city? And how kind of things are seen like a you know, marginal or, or like a problem uh, to deal with. So, and, and we know cities have been built by the people. Um, and in particular, people coming in Latin America between the 40s, 1940s, and 1970s, 1980s. That was the peak of the urbanization process. Uh, so a huge process of migration from the countryside to the cities. Uh, today, Latin America is mostly urbanized uh, as a continent, although there are many differences in, uh, according to different countries. Um, and now, a lot of movement across cities, uh, across urban dwellers. But in, uh, at that point, a, a lot of uh, people coming from the countryside for different reasons. Uh, some like the hope to be part of this new industrialization process and to access you know, better opportunities. But also many of those displaced by different kind of conflicts and, and war and dispossession, of course, of the land. And that's, that's still the case. And you can see uh, also a, a very strong, uh, these pictures are from Brazil. Uh, this is Rio de Janeiro. And now this is today one of the biggest favelas in Rio de Janeiro, Rocinha. Um, and you can see a, a, a very strong racial component into that, but also gender component. And that's still the case. Uh, the majority of these uh, neighborhoods actually uh, composed by women and single, single moms uh, in many of those uh, neighborhoods. And that's usually not being taken into consideration. I had the opportunity to be last week in, in Medellin, in Colombia, uh, a place very well known in urban terms because of the, the social urbanism and kind of good policies that we were presenting outside, but still facing a lot of issues uh, and also a lot of social innovation. And, and this is important to, to keep in mind because usually when we hear these days about innovation, it's all about the private sector usually and technology and all that. So it's important to maintain this component of the social innovation. And this is Angel Ivan, uh, one of the original settlers uh, in this Comuna 13, a very famous Comuna 13 in Medellin, uh, that was part of the heart of the violence in the, back in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and people still struggling to actually build a, a, a great community uh, full of uh, new families and new kids uh, arriving and a lot of graffitis and art. So you will see that community full of tourists actually visiting. And, and very difficult stories, people that have been displaced several times. Actually, in Medellin, uh, more than once uh, from different places, not only in the countryside, but then displaced by, by violence, different kind of violence and, and violent actors within the city. So people had to you know, start over and over again, more than once. So basically, we tried to see this 
as the people, as a, as a city built by the people. And we have to say that in Latin America and actually uh, around the global south now, this will be between the 30% and up to the 70% or even more in some cases. So this is not marginal. This is not something that is, you know, the exception to the rule. This is the rule. And this is going to be actually the bulk of the urbanization in the upcoming 25 years, in particular in South Sub-Saharan Africa and some uh, Southeast Asia countries. So we tried to shift the, the narrative and the way we see these processes. Uh, so not to put like, uh, you know, negative and pejorative uh, connotations and names like marginal, informal, irregular, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and try to see actually the, the, the energy and all the, the resources that people can mobilize to actually build the city if they have the support they need. So basically, you can see here different pictures from different countries. This is in, in South American countries, organizing, mobilizing, uh, and having some you know, wonderful results. This is through some public policies in Mexico, outside Mexico City, and these, house, um, these houses are you know, uh, more than 30 years old. Uh, they're huge houses, uh, very good quality, and very, very affordable uh, as part of that public policy. At that time, some of our members were involved into that. But also, this is important, and you all know this, it's not just about housing. And even if we are lucky enough to have some social housing policies in place, they usually think about housing alone, right? Not the community and not the other things around that. So in these communities, actually, you know, organizations, they think about everything. And, and, and Saki is going to talk about that also in Mississippi. So it's not enough just to have the roof and just to have your house, right? So thinking about how to organize all the different issues, including, you know, community health, uh, urban agriculture, and so on. And some of the communities have been planning that, you know, way ahead. So when they first started, they actually set aside some land for urban agriculture, for example, that came much later, uh, and different things. Some of the schools um, that they, they were put in place in some cases, they actually then became, they were self-organized, and then became part of the official education system, and actually a reference for the whole neighborhood, not just for the community. So we're talking about very, very important uh, things here. So we tried to link that the, and, and to, to frame these things uh, as social production of habitat. So it's not the private production, it's not the, it's not the public production, uh, which is becoming little, very little in, in our countries, but it's the social production. So we consider, consider this a part of the third component of the production of the city and link that actually with a human rights approach. And this is very important, and I don't have time to go into the details, but it's very important for us at the same time to claim our autonomy and our capabilities and our you know, uh, resources to do things, but also be recognized and be supported and access to land and resources and so on. So I have, we have one publication here and that's Spanish only for now. Uh, we're going to leave a copy with Dimitri uh, and Nathan, but it's also available online with case, a compilation of cases we did a few years ago. And the ones that you see with an arrow, uh, they actually, those are cooperatives. They're actually working as, as co-ops. Uh, the other ones are different kind of associations and, and collective uh, forms. Um, so this is Spanish, this is coming from an exhibition we prepared on different cases for the Habitat 3 conference in Quito uh, three years ago, almost three years ago. Um, and this particular case is very, very relevant in Latin America. Uh, it's the case from Uruguay. Maybe some of you are aware of her about this case before. It's a, it's a federation, the Uruguayan Federation of uh, Self-Help Cooperatives, Housing Cooperatives. And that, that movement has already 50 years. Uh, and was in, in 1968, that was the first housing law, a housing cooperative law that became, uh, that was inspired actually by similar laws and similar housing co-ops in other places, and mostly for, from Europe, um, that became a landmark for, for the Latin American uh, housing uh, cooperative movement. Uh, very advanced at the time, still today, and has several components. It's a, it's a specific uh, cooperative law for housing, which is not usually the case uh, in other countries. Um, so several components that are key for this, for this movement and for the success of this movement. So mutual aid, uh, autogestion, so it's not exactly self-management. I think it's stronger than that. 
uh, direct democracy, uh, collective ownership, political autonomy. This is huge. It's a huge issue, uh, you know, how not to get caught in the politics at the local, at the local level, but be very uh, active and, and engaged. And then the technical assistance, the land and building municipal reserves or banks, and public subsidies ma plus uh, credits. Uh, these are the components that are enshrined in the law, and it's not just the it's not just one institution. It's a it's a you know different a group of different institutions supporting that. So that was very very uh, relevant in Uruguay, and that was an, became an inspiration for several other uh, countries. And you need to think about that this was. Uh, also operating under dictatorships uh, in Uruguay and then in other places. So when we talk about urbanization and claiming a place uh, to be part of the city, uh, we're also claiming um, to be part of the movement for a more democratic society. This also inspired by the Uruguayan case. Uh, this is uh, several cooperatives now in Central American countries and the Coseavis, which is a, a, like a... Um, uh, like a group, like a federation of cooperatives in Central American countries. And they will include not only new housing, uh, usually in the periphery, uh, but also the renewal and rehabilitation of uh, old buildings, uh, like the case of Milton Park somehow, in the central core of the cities. And this is very difficult, usual, but, uh, usually, but it's very, very important. Also components about the social and solidarity economy, uh, of course, urban agriculture and the role of women uh, in this movement that is not just happening, but actually is, um, you know, uh, kind of strengthened and, and support, supported by the organization and, uh, and women's leadership in the movement, which is not still the case uh, that much in, in Uruguay. Uh, so this is, this is very important. This movement is growing. These numbers are actually a couple of years old. So there are new cooperatives now um, and it's becoming very important also in terms of not at the same time building cooperatives and the movement and doing advocacy to have, again, the law, the framework, uh, the public subsidies and all that to be able to, to grow the movement. I had this video, but I don't have time to show it. I can leave it and maybe we'll, we'll show it later, uh, some break or something like that. It's a very short video, like seven minutes. And this is a very interesting case uh, of a community land trust in Puerto Rico. Uh, as far as I know, as one of the few community land trusts in the southern hemisphere, as such, as community land trust. And it's very interesting because it's, it's in an area, uh, of the mark on the red, down there, it's a very crucial area in, in San Juan, in the capital of Puerto Rico. It used to be an, an environmental and you know, highly ecological uh, of relevance uh, for, the, for the city, and was occupied uh, for, again, poor people coming from the countryside to look for a place to live in the city without any alternative, so they occupy um, that area. Now, there, is, there are some plans, they have been for, for quite some time now, of course, to recuperate that channel and the environmental you know, um, uh, spirit of that place, but of course, through evictions. Uh, so the community is organized, and they have different you know, options and basically part of the community land trust is to, to be able to stay there in the place while doing the renovation and of course uh, you know, recuperating the, the ecological uh, vocation of, the, of that land. Uh, as you can see, they're very consolidated houses um, and this is a very, very interesting case um, that you can read actually about. Uh, there are several things about that case in, in English available. Um, so finally, a couple of minutes, very quickly, just to mention this platform. So it's not just housing, it's not just new housing, it's not just uh, cooperatives, there are different options. And we know that it, you know, fighting for land and housing is not enough, again. So partnerships and going beyond the silos, as Dimitri was mentioning before, is, is very, very relevant. So this is an, an effort of uh, putting together different platforms and, and international networks, including not only civil society organizations, uh, but also some local authorities into that movement, which is tricky, of course. And this network has been around for about five years now, uh, doing, doing a lot of work to influence or try to influence the, the new urban agenda. Um, some of the components of this right to the city, um, we don't have time to go over those, but basically uh, human rights approach to it, 
uh, the social function of the land and the property are crucial for us. Uh, of course, the democratic management of the city, and meaning that deepening the democracy, not just the liberal and representative uh, democracy. The social economy uh, component of, of, the, of the city and the territory, going beyond the borders of the urban and peri-urban and etc., and actually connecting with the place as a, as a territory and seeing all the environmental um, issues related to that. So, of course, water uh, and air and so on. And, of course, the enjoyment of the places and related uh, with the public spaces in particular and huge struggles to, as you know, defend and protect and maintain public spaces. This, um, finally, some of the things been recognized and included in some of the international instruments, the, the most recent ones, the Sustainable Development Goals or the Agenda 2030 from 2015, uh, very ambitious uh, you know, goals in there, and also the New Urban Agenda from 2016. Uh, Canada, by the way, signed these documents. They are non-binding documents, so legally non-binding documents, but actually is an international commitment, a political commitment. So it's not just for the you know, global south and countries, uh, but it's for everybody. So I think we should keep that in mind, including the US, uh, one of the countries that, of course, as Canada, oppose the inclusion of the right to the city in the new urban agenda. Despite that, it's there. So please, um, yeah, take that into account. Finally, your mayor here from Montreal has been um, part of this movement, Cities for Housing, which is an initiative by Barcelona government, together with different activists, to actually put housing at the center, claiming more powers to actually confront the real estate speculation and the real estate, uh, you know, corporate international developers, uh, but also a commitment to do more and to do better and to do more with the housing co-ops and non-profit and so on. So we should take that into account and, and try to make our mayor uh, accountable for that. So the special rapporteur, also Canadian, based in, in, in Ottawa, uh, a very, a very important ally for us uh, as, as organizations worldwide and she has been involved in this the shift campaign but also the national housing strategy at the Canadian level and that's coming under discussion now so I encourage you to also take a look at that if you haven't uh, because there are many many opportunities to actually uh, strengthen the, the housing cooperative movement in, in Canada so thank you very much and sorry. Great. Uh, big thank you to Lorena. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, all the way from uh, Jackson, Mississippi, Sacagawea Hall, uh, Saki for short, uh, is, uh, is here to speak about um, the uh, Cooperation Jackson, uh, of which uh, she is a co-founder. Uh, it's an African-American-led organization in Jackson, which promotes economic democracy, community ownership, ecology, uh, through a network of cooperatives and citizens' assemblies. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really inspiring example. And give it up for Saki Hall. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, I'm glad that um, Nathan's going to check something because I wanted to say a few words before I get into uh, the PowerPoint. And when Lorena sat down, I, I jokingly said um, she made my speech like 30 more minutes because a lot of what you talked about in the UN Instruments brings me back to when I was working for the U.S. Human Rights Network um, and engaging in both like a, gra a grassroots based process around human rights and then engaging with the tools like the um, CERD around racism that the United States actually had signed on, like does sign on to and needs to be held accountable for. So I think those UN instruments and in my experience of working in the United States um, and around housing and the housing repertoire and all those things is that it's important that uh, we call it a people-centered human rights, that the people use uh, those instruments that are getting created kind of like up here in places that you don't see, um, and hopefully, you know, you can organize and have the privilege to be able to take 
a group to New York or Geneva like the organization that I worked for did so that, um, so that we know the power that we have when we're in numbers um, and so that regardless of what country we're in, we're hold, we hold folks accountable. Um, so you made me think of that, thank you. And also, um, Cooperation Jackson is a member of Rights of the City Alliance, which is based in the United States. <laughs> What? Um, and there's a Homes for All campaign, and the reason why I know Lorena, and the reason why I know Dimitri, Demetrius, um, is because um, I've gone as a representative of Cooperation Jackson to the last four of the trans, they call it transatlantic, housing roundtable, and I did have to point out that transatlantic reminds me of the transatlantic slave trade. And so it's North America and Europe, um, and through the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, uh, and that has been a huge blessing uh, for me, and then when I bring that back home, uh, because we get to meet all of the dope work that's happening in North America, um, and then all of the amazing work that's happening you know, in Europe, and then <laughs> in the global south, which is which is um, a, a special place for me in my heart. And I'm actually a little nervous because the first time, my very first one of these, I met Demetrius, and he was talking, and I was like, this is what we are talking about. And Cooperation Jackson was like, what, maybe a year old? Um, and so, yeah. So, um, so preparing for this trip, I talked to my partner, my husband's uncle, who was in Toronto, and I was like, there's a bus leaving Toronto, can you make it? I, I knew the answer to that, because he's um, not physically able to get on a bus the next day at 9 a.m. to get to Montreal, and he said he wished that he could, and he told me that Malcolm X's mom and dad met here in Montreal, and he was like, and I think it was at a Garvey, yeah, yeah. So it was at like a Garvey convention, a Marcus Garvey convention that the two of them met here. And if it wasn't for me calling him, we needed to check on him anyway. Um, I wouldn't have known that bit of history that's here in Montreal. Um, I've been to Montreal once before. I was about four years old um, for a wedding on my Haitian side of the family. And so coming here now that I'm 41 is like coming to Montreal for the first time. I don't, I'm, I don't know a lot of the history that's happened over all these years, the boroughs, the neighborhoods, the east to west. I've gotten a tour yesterday. We had a walking tour, and then this morning, again, Demetrius <laughs> gave me a bit more of a tour. Um, and so Milton Park and being able to stay and see it live for the first time um, is also something that I feel really um, honored to be able to do on this trip. So, so much of my background is very similar and parallel um, in the pictures that you showed, those black and white pictures, I grew up on the Lower East Side of New York City uh, with tenements. Uh, uh, the pictures that you showed are very similar pictures that are in a book. I'm not going to mention it and go into that. Um, and so this now here feels like coming full circle and time, yep. And the book that I can't hold up because I forgot to bring some, Jackson Rising, has a chapter my chapter where I'm interviewed and the title of it is about coming full circle because uh, I grew up in a housing cooperative and that was a whole thing. So, all right. History. Can I make this show now? PowerPoint, please. So you'll love it when you see this, because history is important. Um, and in the tradition that I come out of, we say free the land, uh, and land is important. And then one thing that Nathan made me think about is a guy actually ran um, in New York City under the slogan, the rent is too damn high. The rent is too damn high. And the rent is too damn high is being brought back by women in Miami at the Miami Workers Center. Um, 
because the rent is too damn high, it was then, and it's getting worse in places that are hot markets like New York City and and New York and Miami and Jackson. It's not so much a hot market right now. When I started doing these kind of talks, I would say Jackson was a cold market right now. It's about lukewarm. Fannie Lou Hamer defines self-determination as the process by which a person controls their own life. And Malcolm X says that revolution is based on land. Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the Jackson Cush plan. It is a strategy that the Cooperation Jackson as an institution comes out of. Um, and you see Mississippi um, has a star. So that's Mississippi in the deep south. Yeah, it's going fast because this isn't the right one. Um, okay. So, our mission is to advance the development of economic democracy, solidarity economy. These are all pretty big words. Um, and Cooperation Jackson was launched on May Day, May 1st, International Workers' Day. And this was shortly after the late Mayor Shokwe Lumumba passed away uh, in 2014. So I've been telling anybody and everybody um, in Jackson when I'm walking around that Cooperation Jackson's fifth birthday is this May. And this is not the right PowerPoint. Mm. Okay, can we pause the time and... <laughs> So that's the real cover. <laughs> Woo! All right. Our mission is to build a solidarity economy. <laughs> so we have the set of principles that are up here I wanted to share are separate from the idea of building cooperatives and a cooperative movement. Um, they are based on our frameworks around human rights, intersectionality, and a just transition. We have 13 cooperative principles, which are both based on the international co-op principles and also um, principles similar to Mondragon. Um, and so there are, we can talk about reasons why there's like political, the political and ideological nature of the work that we're doing means that our, our co-op principles are larger than, you know, the Roshar and, and um, the international co-op movement globally. Um, talked about this. So build and fight is a really important part of our work. And it was, in fact, right around the time where we were predicting that Trump was going to win that we started using more of the build and fight language, although it's always been a part of our thinking, um, right? So of course, we have to keep fighting because um, 
I don't like using the war analogy, Nathan. We have to keep fighting so that we can put a Band-Aid and go to the hospital, but we have to be building at the same time. And for us, the building part, without there being a hierarchy, the building part we know is critical for our survival, like literally our survival. Um, and so this image helps to show the four different areas uh, and the um, like the more pol policy based side of the work in terms of calling for Jackson to become in 20 years a fab city, a solidarity economy, a sustainable city, human rights. And this mirrors the work that we're doing on our side in terms of the institutions and the co-ops and the programs that we're um, building. I wanted to give you a little context about Jackson and Mississippi for those who do not know anything about it. Um, and I'm gonna breeze through this part, right? Because Mississippi was at one point the richest state in the nation. Um, and now it's basically still very rich, very, very rich. Um, and the health indicators or the education indicators in Jackson and Mississippi are at the very bottom. So Jackson, um, people like to say like Jackson was at the top and now it's at the bottom. Um, you can see in these pictures, this is actually up the block from where I live. The picture on the right hand side um, is a house that is now a part of our community land trust. The earth has reclaimed lots and lots of space and blocks in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, which it will do. Um, the current context, this image is a little bit old, but it still uh, holds true. I um, printed out Google Maps, and then I used some different um, pen color pencils to show the different areas and the different master plans and the medical corridor and the West Jackson master plan and all these different master plans. And so where we are situated is in the yellow. I'm glad that it's very bright so you can see it. Uh, this is kind of the area that we um, focus on. And we are basically like you can see, it's surrounded, right? And then going further down, So we very much see West Jackson and where we are situated and the amount of land that we've been able to accumulate in the community land trust um, as, as a fortification, as like if we can hold the line here and then these ideas and this culture and this work can spread, then you know, potentially we could, we could uh, protect South Jackson, which in a lot of ways um, is... Uh, I don't want to say worse than West Jackson, but um, it, you know the statistics uh, are even uh, more stark. So what we're up against is the struggle for black self-determination and not too far, that's a picture of our folks up at the top like three years ago, um, the plan for urban renewal and gentrification, this um, housing development uh, right now is in phase three. Um, it's still very, very vacant. Uh, and when I first saw it and I'd like stopped and literally drove around and took pictures with my cell phone because I was like this, this is what is coming. I hope people can see it. Um, and so this image helps you kind of like and helps me think about our work because it is really creating an ecosystem. I like to think of it as a web. We have um, the Fannie Lou Hamer Community Land Trust, which is the land at the, at the root, at the base. Um, we are looking and been studying eco village models around the world. Um, and we now have, um, I'll show you a block, which is gonna be our eco village pilot. It is our eco-village pilot. It's called the Ewing Street Initiative. So in this image, there's housing co-ops and the different co-ops that we've started. And then there's also like what can come out of a housing cooperative and other housing construction. Uh, a lot of the people who are in the neighborhood, particularly older men, have experience um, and, you know, experience and probably even degrees in doing plumbing, electricity. And so looking at our neighborhood and our folks as a resource, not only like capital, uh, 
we have the potential to start a, co a construction co-op and actually have folks um, do what they want to do, which is to be productive and, and, and to help. So folks, you can drive around the neighborhood and see a lot of black men, a lot of older black men um, on the street. You know, it seems like folks are hanging out and it's because there are no jobs. You know, there are, there are no jobs. And the jobs that you can get in Jackson are very low wage jobs. Mississippi is a right to, right to work state, which basically means you don't have a right to work. Um, or start a union. Um, and so this is another image uh, with the Sustainable Community Land, Tr you know, the Sustainable Communities Initiative that helps to show in a, in a different way the vision and the idea of, um, of like we've talked about so far and we're gonna be talking about further, that things are, things are connected. We, we can't only talk about land, we have to talk about the ecology, we have to take that very seriously. Um, community councils, that kind of thing. So I'm gonna look, I'm gonna quickly go through pictures so that you can see some of the development that has happened. This is the first center um, that we were able to, um, to get uh, pictures on the side, show you what it looked like when it was a uh, childcare, uh, childcare um, center. And it had, hadn't been a childcare center probably for about like four years when we acquired it, they wanted to retire and we didn't know that it included um, lots of green space in the back. Um, there's been ebbs and flows. These, uh, we have a community production center. The building that's there in the white was when we actually finally got that building and we were cleaning it out. The pictures at the top are the training that um, members did in Detroit um, to help starting to learn how you 3D print. Um, that's a meeting, that's okay. That was the, <laughs> that, <laughs> that was actually like the UN finally de decided to have, not decided, was pushed to have a decade for African people and African descendants. Um, and so we hosted an event for that monumental um, victory. Uh, we have renamed the center after Kwesi Balagoon. Uh, and so you see some transitional photos where there is no name there. This is Brandon King, who is an artist and a DJ and an organizer. And that's his painting. I hadn't even seen a lot of his artwork. And he brought this in and said, we've renamed it through this membership process after Kwesi Balagoon. This is a painting that I did in college. I'm gonna frame it, put it up, um, and this is, it looks like new, it looks like brand new, it's not new, it's still the, 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 the base, our home. Um, I'm gonna end with a quote from Kwesi Balagoon, and I'm gonna read it so that it can be translated in French, because um, it's important to why we're here. That picture was solar panels, we have them on both centers now. This is Freedom Farms, that's their logo, their own logo. The question of autonomy and semi-autonomy and how do you create a federation is huge for us. Rainbow Natural Grocery Store was the only co-op um, in Jackson, uh, the only grocery co-op in Mississippi, and unfortunately, they had to close. That's a long story, we can talk about it. Later, um, more pictures of growing. My son is in that middle picture. Um, these are some before and after pictures. So this is the Green Team Cooperative. The Green Team is doing really, really, really well. Uh, right now, it's the season where everybody and their grandmother goes out with lawnmower equipment. Um, and so they are um, up at the top, you can see the composting um, and the collection of you know, what's called waste from when you do lawn care. And that has actually been used um, this past season that got used in Freedom Farms to be, to be compost, right? So like 
we have been and we know that you can use food as compost and then we've done that before and now we've been able to use the um, compost from the lawn care for the farm. It's awesome. There I am. The one time I was helping on Ewing Street because I'm a mom and an activist um, and I could not hold the machete. Miss Layla is right behind me. Miss Layla is born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. She's got to be in her like early 70s. And I was offering water to everyone because I needed water. So that's <laughs> the green theme. Um, the Fab Lab has opened. It's very exciting. Please say, woohoo. Um, and the, the flyer that's pixelated and isn't coming through yet was um, in February. The, the, yeah, in February. And that was, I used that also as my birthday celebration because I was born in February. And yeah, Kwame with some equipment. So I'm going to read this quote. Hmm, maybe not. Okay. There's a really dope quote by Kwesi Balagoon who um, was a former political prisoner. He passed away in jail. Uh, he was openly queer at a time where that was hard to be as a black man um, and even harder probably in the black liberation movement, folks who um, had to go underground. Um, and we still have a whole lot of work to do when it comes to hetero patriarchy, right? So um, he actually organized in New York City. I, um, I learned about him, like I wish I had learned about him in college and, that, and even when I did further school, I learned about him once I became a member of the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Um, and his quote, for me, when we were talking about the process of renaming, why we're renaming, what do we rename it? Do we rename it after somebody who's local, like Fannie Lou Hamer or Medgar Evers? Um, all the different, you know, tensions and contradictions that emerge during that process when you're trying to practice deep democracy. Um, I was sold based on this quote by Kwesi Balagoon because he talks about the fact that we have to take over buildings. He talks about the fact that we have to feed ourselves. Um, he talked about cooperative economics. Um, and so we decided as a membership, um, and at this point our membership, like honestly, had contracted, we went through this beautiful process and renamed it after Kwesi Balagoon. Um, and so I'm excited that we uh, are about to be five years old. And then in the, in the context of like talking um, with groups and looking around the world, five years old is a baby, right? Our organization is a baby. And we're trying to do this, um, this vision that has come from before even I was born. Um, and so I'm really honored and pleased and thank you for inviting me to be here with you guys to talk about our work, to exchange, to learn, um, and to grow. And, um, and, and I feel in the last day, not even a day and a half, I feel very well taken care of. Um, being invited here says to me that you care about the struggle for African people in the United States. Okay. And so, in conclusion, we're going to have a discussion and we'll be able to talk more. Thank you. But Thanks, everyone. Another big round for all the speakers. So, so the good news is there are a lot of people who have a lot to say about community control of land. Uh, the bad news is that that means that we're running quite late. Uh, so what we're going to do is um, 
we, we hope to have a discussion with, with these folks, but we're, we're going to have to push through in order to keep the rest of our schedule and get out of here in time and not completely cut the other workshops. Um, so during the open space, I, uh, I'm tentatively proposing that we're going to create some space for people who want to speak to um, Saki and Lorena uh, then. Uh, for now, we're going to take, uh, it's not really officially a break, but anyone who has a pressing need, uh, feel free to uh, leave and come back. Um, and for everyone else, uh, we're just going to have a few brief announcements before we move to the next panel. Uh, so, uh, Erica, come on up. Thank you very much for giving us the time and space to talk about this program. Um, we are here to present Changer Montreal, which is an initiative to start a dialogue about the social solidarity economy at universities. It is an inter-university uh, program, and we are preparing uh, like a, pro uh, a session for the fall where students can have grants and can have coaching and training on social solidarity economy. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Erica Licon. I'm, I'm Shyla Wolf. So uh, please approach to talk, if you're interested to know more about this program, approach to talk with us during the break or after that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now Thomas from uh, from Forum Jeunesse. Hello. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Est-ce que je peux avoir votre attention juste quelques secondes? Uh, je m'appelle Thomas Taloté. Je travaille au Forum Jeunesse de l'île de Montréal. Uh, le Forum Jeunesse de l'île de Montréal est une instance de concertation Montréal. Et euh, nous avons, euh, le Forum Jeunesse a contribué euh, au financement de, de cet événement. Euh, donc euh, je voulais euh, profiter de l'occasion pour saluer le travail qui a été réalisé par toute l'équipe. Euh, nous, quand Nathan, euh, nous a, Nathan McDonald, qui est euh, ici près du micro, nous a, propos, nous a parlé de son projet euh, pour la première fois il y a maintenant euh, 8 ou 9 mois. Merci. Lorsque Nathan McDonald, qui est ici près du micro, nous a parlé de son projet pour la première fois il y a huit ou neuf mois, euh, le Forum Jeunesse, nous, on a décidé d'embarquer euh, là-dedans. Au début, on s'est dit, euh, bon, alors le, le, le contrôle communautaire des terres, l'économie sociale et solidaire, c'est des sujets très spécifiques, très complexes, sur lesquels nous, au Forum Jeunesse, on ne travaille pas particulièrement, mais on a fait le pari d'embarquer là-dedans, puis on est bien content de l'avoir fait, parce que je pense que euh, votre présence euh, à vous tous et toutes aujourd'hui euh, montre que c'est un sujet euh, qui, qui, préoccupe, euh, qui préoccupe le monde. Donc je suis vraiment heureux de vous voir en grand nombre et, euh, et puis une fois de plus, je, voilà, je tiens à saluer le travail qui a été accompli par, Na par Nathan et son équipe depuis des mois. C'est une sacrée logistique d'organiser un événement de cette ampleur-là. Donc euh, vraiment, euh, Nathan, bravo, bravo à toi, bravo à ton équipe, bravo à Nicolas, bravo à Maria, bravo à tous les autres. Voilà, il mérite une bonne main d'abolissement. Bon colloque à tous, merci. Merci Thomas. Donc euh, par la suite. So I'm just going to go ahead and start introducing our, our, our second uh, plenary panel. So. Um